Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Coronaville. What next? I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, the guy who just sat down. That's Winston Welch, and Stephanie Dalton is with us. Okay, and Cynthia can't make it today, but we send our regards. In any event, uh, this is a Coronaville, and we have a lot to talk about. Let me throw a uh, let me throw a, 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 a ringer at you guys. I got a call five or ten minutes ago from an old friend of mine, kind of a Republican. Um, and uh, he's, he's criticizing both Republicans and Democrats. And he's worried about both federal and state making mistakes so that we have, uh, you know, this uh, horrendous situation on our hands. And it reminds me, as we discussed before the show, of the comments by General Hara, where he suggests I'm going to have civil unrest here. If we don't have food, or even if we do, we may have civil unrest. Can, can you get your comments on that, Winston? What do you think about that? I mean, anything's possible, but I don't, we're, we're not seeming to be there. And as, as long as people have, you know, food and shelter and, and their needs are being met, which we can do by uh, disbursements and by, uh, you know, cash payments for the while until things start going again, I, there's no reason for that to happen. Um, it's, it's just, it's, his job is emergency management, uh, you know, uh, planning and seeing what would happen in worst case scenarios. We, we need to have people like that, uh, but we don't need to manifest that here or anywhere else in this nation, certainly. Yeah, I hope so, hope so. But of course, right now we have so many confusing signals that, um, that there are people who could get angry or uh, feel liberated in some way. If you feel liberated about, um, you know, uh, crashing into the Michigan uh, state capitol and you may you may feel liberated about other things like with weapons. So, what is what is your thought about this, uh, Stephanie? I, I am uh, terrified, frankly. I heard I heard about that yesterday, and I, I just never expected anything like that to come up here. But then I'm not enough, obviously, in touch with the people who are out at Aloha Stadium today getting food because they can't buy it, don't have enough money to buy it. So um, I guess we need to have more of a scan about how people are doing here and what it, where's the break point and how can we avoid that break point? How, what can we do? I mean, I'm happy to help if yeah. I'm happy Well, to yeah, I mean, if the, if, the, if the food system doesn't hold up, and that means the free food, because that's the ultimate you know, bottom line of it, when people have no other choice and they need to have free food. Um, you know, that, that is, that's going to be really serious. Uh, and I wonder if we have a metric on that. I had a discussion yesterday, the day before, uh, with uh, our chief scientist, Mike DeWert. And he said, you know, the, the, the thing missing in this whole examination of the reopening is uh, any kind of metric to determine, you know, the moral dilemma here. The moral dilemma being <clears throat> You're worried about people dying from a failure of the economy. You're worrying about people dying from, from COVID. And, and if you decide that there are more people, more suffering going to be from the economy, then maybe that's the priority. If you decide that there's fewer people who die and have suffering from the economy, a failure of the economy, um, you know, then you focus on that. Since we, you know, we have all these numbers going on about, the, um, about COVID, uh, I don't know if our analysis is all that good, but we do have numbers. Uh, what we don't have is numbers on how well we might do in reopening the economy. And that's, that's really important. And it's not beyond analysis. You know, you can use um, various ways to analyze the state of the economy. And, and the key to that, by the way, according to our chief scientist, Mike DeWert, um, is that you have to examine parts of the economy and see how well they're doing. We have the ability to do this. So if I tell you that, you know, reopening the restaurants saved so many jobs, um, but um, not reopening the theaters cost so much money. Um, and, and if I tell you that this results in suicides, it results in, in the, um, the, uh, um, the, um, the kind of disease that comes from stress for not having money, you know, then, then you got to factor that in. Of course, you have pre-existing conditions and you have to factor that in. He said the key to metrics on this was to compare the number of people who died from stress today as against the number of people who died from stress a year or six months ago. And using AI, you can actually make metrics on this. 
you could have an index of stress-related illness uh, or suicide uh, because of the failure of the economy. And you could compare that to deaths from COVID. I mean, you know, it strikes me as a, a really interesting way of looking at it. <clears throat> we, are, we are not looking scientifically, you know, at the, the effects of the degradation or resurrection of the economy, and we should be. We haven't really analyzed that. When Trump gets up and says, we're going to open the economy, he doesn't know what he's saying. And the CDC makes a report, maybe with some wisdom in it, and he shelves that. So the public has no clue what it means. And I, I frankly think a lot of the governors don't have a clue. What do you guys think? Stephanie, what do you think? How do we make this moral decision? Well, uh, frankly, I think that a lot of people have done some analysis about that. Certainly not, you know, with, with the tools of uh, statistics and, and uh, that kind of analysis. But I believe that there's a lookout there because I've, I've, I was... Uh, fighting to figure out why anybody would go to a restaurant, as we've seen all these people go to in the last few days or weeks. But I've, I figure that what people have done is they've seen that the majority of the cases are poor people. The majority of the cases are people of color. The majority of the cases are those who already have uh, underlying uh, health conditions. And they're looking at themselves as in the prime of life, and they're not affected. And, they, and that's why it's not a belief. They've done an analysis. They are immune to a certain extent. I, I agree with you. They, they have been doing analyses, but... Um, yeah. So that uh, of the population, that demographic has made its decision and they're going to go out. Okay, more power to them if that's going to help bring... Okay, Winston, do you think we can do better on trying to figure out the moral dilemma? Who says we can always do better? Um, I think Dr. Fauci said that. Um, when, when asked, can, can we do, could, could, could we have done better? We are a nation that always wants to do better. That defines us as a people. Uh, so that doesn't end. You don't get to just get to the end point, uh, to, to a point and say, oh, we did, this was perfect and there's, it will never get better. But, you know, I, I uh, agree Did you with, use the word perfect just now? There is no perfect. Yeah, we get to the point and then we- Not, not we, in the we, White House, then, because whenever the word perfect comes up, uh, you know, it doesn't mean perfect anymore. Well, alternative realities not included, but otherwise, as, as Americans, basically, we want to be uh, more efficient, more effective, more kind, more whatever. We, we always want to better ourselves and our society. Well, I'll, I'll and, add one to you. We've had a lot of discussion with our historian, John Davidan. This, is, this country is filled with American exceptionalism. Now that means we're great. We, we're great as a people, we're great as a, an economy, we're great as a, a global power, we're all great. And the problem with exceptionalism is if it ever was true, it is not true now. We are exceptionally not exceptional right now. So well, I think the means... old notion of being great is over and we have to be realistic. She's shaking well, her head, yeah. You, you can be realistic and, and aspire towards greatness, but part of our greatness and exceptionalism, and I probably will count myself a little bit in that category, is that we have the ability for introspection, and we have historically had that. And right now we have a little bump in the road, and we have bumps in the road. It's towards a more perfect union. It's, we, we, are, we are in a moment of existential crisis right now, but we will get through it, and we will come out on the other side. But your opening question, I think, is is important uh, that we are looking at. We're, we're at the, the way that I've been terming it is the, uh, the beginning, uh, the end of the beginning. So now that we have dealt with this, okay, how do we, here in Hawaii, we have a luxury of being able to do this. They have given up in the mainland on the idea of containment. They are going to let the laboratory of America be like Sweden and say, this virus is just going to go where it goes. Let's do the best we can in certain things like old folks home or, or whatnot. But basically here in Hawaii, uh, you know, there was a great article I thought by Cliff Slater in Honolulu Star Advertiser's uh, paper on Monday on the, the 11th of May. And he talks about a plan B, another approach. And it's a, it's a, it's a way to look at this and say, it's not either or, it's, it's both and. And maybe we can have a, a, an approach that, that looks at the, as you were saying, the devastation into 
um, the economy of people's lives as it increase, uh, you know, alcoholism, drug abuse, suicides, uh, uh, you know, domestic violence, and and then just the the rot of the soul of not of not having uh, meaningful uh, work. Until that time, we can support. Well, I, I totally agree. We have to be smart, uh, like Singapore. We have to be nimble. We have to, you know, be aware, and we have to be ready to react on what we learn. Uh, because we don't know how this works, and we don't know how this the socio sociology works, and so this is a time when you know when think tech can be involved in an important conversation, and the conversation is what's going on, and and what new um, what new uh, uh, inventory of of tools can we bring to bear to make it work? I mean, for example, UH said it's going to start uh, physical classes again for the fall semester. There was an article to say that most colleges, most of higher education in this country are not going to do that. There's only a handful of, of uh, you know, colleges, universities that are actually telling you that they're going to start open classes and reopen the classes in September. But you know what? <clears throat> There's a benefit in thinking that you can. There's also a benefit in watching everything so carefully and maybe changing your mind. You know, it could be that is the kind of strategy that you have to look at uh, to say, okay, we'd like to do it, it's aspirational, but we're gonna be very aware of how things are going because things could go badly as that guy uh, Bright said in Congress and as Fauci is saying, um, it's, it's things could go badly and you have to react, you have to be nimble. Stephanie, what, what, would you weigh in on this please? I, I'm just weighing in on that there's no reason why we can't do what we want here in Hawaii because we can go outside and have classes outside. We don't, and even if we are inside, many buildings are not air conditioned at AQH or I guess maybe I haven't been up there lately enough. But anyway, uh, the circulation, that you're not in a heating system that's recycling. So I, we could do more. And, and, and that's what I say about America. We could do more. Being in this situation is unreal and just not of our choosing. We're in this situation because somebody else is controlling everything, including the CDC. Can you imagine? Could you ever have imagined this? There is no reason that we are not exceptional and leading the world on this. But well, but we're not though, Stephanie. The reality is uh, NIH has been politicized. CDC has been politicized. FDA has been politicized and of course, you know, bureaucratic. They become horrendously bureaucratic. What was the last thing? It took five weeks to approve something that was critical to the, the future of uh, public health. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's, they're, they're all kind of missing in action. These are the agencies we have relied on or believed we could rely on all these years. And your friend Trump, you know, has diffused, you know, is it his, yeah, okay, well, he's, He's he pulled the wings out of all of them. And so they're not really functioning. And so what is that? Does it leave it to the individual governors, some of whom are Republican and they follow Trump um, and, you know, and do bizarre things? Um, you leave it to the, the, the you know, the, the, the individual communities. Don't you think for a national and international epidemic pandemic, we need leadership. We need the World Health Organization to lead us. We need the White House to lead us. We're not getting that. How can we possibly achieve national testing, for example, or making uh, PPE with uh, the Defense Production Act if we don't have any leadership? And P.S., I think we can all assume we don't have any leadership. Well, we have whistleblowers. We have whistleblowers, but not leadership. Let's see if we have leadership. There's example of uh, potential leadership. Uh, let's see if the leadership picks up on this and it's out of the house, it's representatives. They want to use an AmeriCorps model to hire hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to get out there and do uh, track and trace, okay? So they believe that yeah, they can put that model into play and start picking up on these hundreds of people that have to be tracked every, every day. And it's an enormous task. And that's the only way it's going to be accomplished is with numerous uh, worker bees. And, and at the same time, that would pull in jobs, just like this, uh, the Conservation Corps, the CCC of the uh, New Deal area. Era. Yeah, okay. Well, what do you think? I saw you shake your head, Winston, yeah. but I couldn't tell whether it was left or right or up or down. Who's going to let I, it? Yeah, I, 
<laughs> the uh, we do have leadership, Jay. It's just maybe not in the traditional places that we expect it. We're having governors form PACs inside of the nation. We're having leadership from, say, I don't know, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, from the Chancellor of Germany, from uh, mayors, from uh, from companies. We're having it pop up all over the place. And the reality may be that as as we evolve as America and Americans, and we have always evolved, that we uh, that Donald Trump has forced us into a new um, regionalism and federalism, and that may be, it's a new testing ground of what's going to work and what isn't going to work. And uh, certain companies are going to say you have to do this and others are going to say you don't. And certain states are going to say you have to do this and others don't. And they will, and judging on the basis of how their population reacts, hopefully we'll be able to look at each other and say, hmm, that's working there. Maybe we should adopt that here or that wasn't working. You're going to have somebody making the decision, Winston. Somebody who has got to be cogent and aware and logical and even well-educated about such things, making that decision. Just being aware is not enough. You have to actually be able to make a decision. It is. It's happening. I mean, look at Hawaii. We, 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 even when we may want to criticize certain government actions or lack thereof, we have shut down the virus in the state to one, one new case a day. Day, there was okay, no but now we're reopening on one day that. we're reopening tomorrow Say we're again. reopening everything is going to get reopened here and we're going to have tourists by the thousands and we will here. learn from that and and we will learn and if we start saying wow you know what there was just this entire whatever nursing homes or uh shopping centers that, that everybody works at gets infected and then we say that death rate is not acceptable so what did we learn from that we learned that we have to implement this policy or that policy. Yeah, and we, we, don't have, we don't have time to learn slowly here. You're going to have one patient comes in and, and affects, infects a whole bunch of people. You have Wuhan all over again. So the learning has to be very quick. It has to be 24 by 7, okay? And the decision process has to be 24 by 7, and you have to use every tool. So I want to, I want to go to testing for a minute and talk about two myths Okay, the first myth is, and Stephanie, you mentioned this, is let's try to get herd immunity. And that means arguably 60% of the people in the given community have to have the disease. But if you have 60%, it's a myth. 60% of the people, and who knows whether that's the right percent, um, <clears throat> then, uh, then they will be infected. That's, that's the assumption of herd immunity. And if they will be infected, that X percent and a higher percent for seniors, okay, will die, D-I-E, die. Is that what we really want? Is that a solution? Are we serious about herd immunity? Isn't it better to flatten the curve and wait for a vaccine? Well, well Jay, uh, we have no indication that there is any such thing as herd immunity with this virus. As I mentioned, the Black Plague has no herd immunity. The whole, the whole village is, is consumed. They're all dead. You walk through, it's empty. So we don't know what this uh, walk through in the aftermath, and it's a, so we don't know if that is a viable uh, condition. Okay, I'm with you. Where where are you on this, Winston? Five T's. Also, in the, the newspaper testing, tracing, tracking technology, and training. These are not. Do we have that? We, we are that. going towards that. We're going towards that. That was from Carl Kim, who's a, a derp uh, professor at UH. I totally we're moving agree. Towards been that. on a show about this. I, yeah, I totally we're, agree, we're but... smart. We are. We do have smart people. We do are have we people. nimble? They are going. The cream is going to rise to the top. I mean, eventually, it's the the truth will get out, and the best truth will get out. And there may be more than one truth. I mean, the way that the South Koreans are doing it, they didn't close down restaurants. They didn't close down a lot of stuff. Uh, but what they did find was they opened up the disco and people got infected. So what did they learn? Don't open up the disco right now, but you can still have your restaurants open and you can okay, do these let's, other let's things. Let's take that example. That really works. If you're quick, you know, you see that the, the disco is a problem, you close it down. <clears throat> but you also have to prevent whatever you saw as a problem from propagating, you know, from doing contagion. How do you do that? Well, you do that with uh, testing and tracking, right? <clears throat> so still today, we have a problem in testing. 
and we have a problem in tracking, despite the fact that some people are going to be hired. We need to hire them right now. We need to train them right now. And we, knew, we need to have testing right now. And furthermore, and this is the myth I was referring to, everybody says, oh, we tested X number of people today, whether it's hundreds or thousands, um, and we have a cumulative testing, you know, we've cumulatively tested X number of millions of people around the country. That, that is, that's wrong thinking, in my opinion, because you have to keep on testing them. You have to test them surgically. You have to test them quickly. You have to test them with a non-invasive test <clears throat> so that they, they come to you. Um, and you can't have the, you know, this kind of uh, uh, parameter where you're only going to test them if they come to you and tell you they got, they got the gross symptoms. You know, CDC has added, doubled the number of symptoms uh, that, that take place with, with COVID. And th the testing is based on the old minimal symptoms like fever and can't breathe and uh, whatever else, there's like three or four things. Um, so my, my point is, are we really being nimble on testing? And are we willing to test again and again? And are we willing to track so that we know who to test and who's got it and who's giving it to this? We have the science, but we're not doing it. And if we don't do it, we risk an infection uh, out of the disco. Well, I think we're not doing what Korea did at all. And we're missing an entire piece of that act. And that's gonna keep us from containing this thing. For instance, they find the, per they, they hear about the breakout or their rep the reports come in or people say it. They go immediately and get them, as you say, Jay. They go after where the virus is and do the testing. And if you're positive, you do not go home. You do not go home. In fact, you don't go home waiting for your test result. You sit on the chair for three days until it comes back. And then if you're positive, um, you were isolated. Um, we, you were we have a guy coming on the show tomorrow who is a researcher, an MD researcher at uh, Michigan State University. And he's got a test which is non-invasive, a swab in the mouth uh, that, that takes minutes. Okay, um, and, and, and I, I'm, I understand that it's accurate too. Yeah. Uh, he's, and it's new technology. I don't know if he's patented it or whether he's gonna give it away. And he's been waiting on approval for this test for oh. over a month. Wow. Um, and there must be others like that. But then uh, what so my, my concern is, you know, if this is really an emergency, if it's really a war, let's fight it. Let's do this stuff right away. Once you identify, testing as important, then you must test and analyze and determine the, the, the parameters for testing. Um, so don't you agree, Winston? I, I don't see you shaking your head up or down now. Uh, don't you agree that that's true? And if you want to do the Korean thing, if you want to do the smart, nimble awareness thing, you've got to have testing and you've got to have new systems for testing. Well, new systems, certainly. And part of that does include testing, but we don't know what does the testing mean? That means that you were exposed to it and you had it. And does that mean you can't get it again? We're seeing people that are testing positive again after they've had it. So maybe they're getting another strain of it or uh, we, we don't know exactly what that means, but we but do you know- you agree with me that you have to test over and over again. And that when somebody oh, says, oh, we have, we've done 5 million tests in the country, that is not probative. You have I to see test all very, the time. Very easily, Jay. I mean, first of all, we're protected on this island basically we're you know we're down to single digit cases every day one two we at this point we can test everybody who you've been around by by your apple phone or your your samsung you see who you came into contact with within six feet and they get a notice that says hey you were around this we're not telling you who it was go get tested it can be wiped out here but then we have to test everybody Do we have that now what's that the apple and i don't know if they rolled it out yet but at this point we can, anybody coming into the state, they get three tests, 40 hours before they get on the plane, right before they get on the plane at the departure lounge and a 10 minute test. And then after they get here, maybe four tests, and then another one three days later. Is it, is it um, something we're not used to as, as Americans, of, you know, having to say where we're staying, it sounds kind of, you know, Soviet. Well, it's a pandemic. So we're not trying to infringe on people's civil liberties. We're trying to keep people safe 
and alive. And there's ways that we can do it that are better uh, and that, that allow us to keep our liberties, but also that protect the public health. And because we're in Hawaii, we have a very unique laboratory, just like New Zealand does. South Korea in another way, because they're basically an island, uh, you know, cut off uh, as they are. So we have different laboratories where we're going to see different things. We're going to see the mainland go with these ideas of seeing how herd immunity works. We're going to see Sweden versus Norway. We're going to have a lot of data sets to, comp uh, to compare with, and we're going to see how it's all going to come out in the wash. And there's no answer that's right right now, 100%. We're learning. We're learning fast, and uh, we're, we can adapt as we move along. We better. We better do that. Better. We better do that in Hawaii, especially because we have all these potential infectious people coming around. We better test them and we better enforce the quarantine. You know, it's not clear to me what we do if we find we have somebody infected. Do we send them home? Do we put them in a hotel room? Uh, there was one thing about we fine him $5,000, but does that mean he stays in a hotel room plus he pays the fine? I mean, we have really got to discourage this and we got to control it. And we got to do something when we find a live case that could be, it could infect the, you know, the whole state. It only takes one. It only takes one. And we have to be really, really nimble. So we're kind of relying on our leadership on David Ige, uh, on Josh Green, on uh, Kirk Caldwell, on, uh, on General Hara, for that matter. Um, we have to do exactly what you're saying, and we have to do it right away. We can't do this in retrospect. We have to be really smart. Well, you're shaking your head, Stephanie. Well, yes, I am, because you're right on the mark, right after what Winston says has to happen. That's complex enough. But then you have to do something with these infected people. You can't just say, aloha, go on out about your business. And they, because that's why we need to test again, because we got to find out if, if they re get reinfected. But my point is that it's costly, because where are these people going to go? Who's going to isolate them? And they did that in the in Asia. But what we need to do is we need some partnership with big business here. Most of these hotels in Waikiki are not local operations. These are huge big chains. They are multi-billionaires. They need to kick in to, to take care of some of this because we can't say go to your hotel room for 14 days and sit there or stay in the hotel because we can't put the Honolulu Police Department all down in Waikiki to make sure all these visitors are staying in their hotels. We need some cooperation. Oh, Stephanie, you're right on the money, literally. So here, here's a state with a, a billion dollar shortfall, at least. I, I would venture to say it's way more than that. It, and, it, and the legislature just came back in and they got all these, uh, you know, propositions and initiatives and bills and they got to deal with it and all that and query whether they have the money. And Stephanie's idea is a pretty good idea because we have, we, the tourist industry, the state, with the engine of its economy being in Waikiki, we have to spend a lot of money to make Winston's things come true. Winston, don't you agree with Stephanie? There must be a way to get that from the guys who, who tend to make them, you know, who tend to benefit but most. That is these big, you know, global corporations that own these huge hotels and generally speaking have huge profits and will have huge profits again if we succeed. Don't you think they should chip in to paying this enormous, you know, bill we're going to get for doing what you're saying? Well, we all need to chip in. This is not an epidemic that's only affecting hotels or workers at hotels or anybody else. Everybody needs to step up to the plate. There's a great place for hotels right now. They're 99% empty. Uh, they should be housing the homeless, if nothing else. There's a lot of hotels there that, that we can solve a couple problems right now and say, hey, you know what? We're done with being homeless right now. It's a public health threat on many levels, uh, social, uh, moral, political, economic, uh, just for people showing up in uh, emergency rooms with a, you know, with a diabetic infection. We can solve a lot of things right now. Yes, people do need to be housed in these things, but somehow it could be a, a tax levy on, on visitors coming in that we say, uh, sorry, you tested positive. But for local people, if you've got that, that's why we have a tax base. As far as getting back to your an earlier point, we could very easily give every person in this state who needs it above, below a certain income level, who's not working right now, an EBT card that says, here is, you know, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks a month for you to spend on food. Here's a voucher for your rent until we get this thing up and floating. Now people will say, oh, well, why should they work then? 
people want to work, Jay. They want to contribute. They want to be productive members of society. Uh, there will be some that, that, that aren't, certainly. But for right now, we stabilize people with support that is common sense, that's compassionate, and that's, that's, that's sane while we get through this together. This is not a uh, only them, only us. You know, okay. it's complex. We have I hope, a complex. I hope the whole legislature is listening to you and us. Uh, so, Stephanie, we're out of time. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm more sorry than I think I've ever been. That we're out of time, but we are out of time. So why don't you take a minute and close? Well, I, I'm afraid that uh, if you're asking me to close, oh, were you? Um, yeah, well, you have one minute to close. Don't, don't spread it away now. All right, I you think one minute to close. I think we have um, covered uh, the the course here. We have absolutely done a very good analysis uh, from multiple point of views on this program, and and we've pointed out the the very challenging, daunting task that Hawaii has. Without even we also address the national crisis, but uh, here in Hawaii we certainly do, and we have a chance to lead the nation because, as Winston's been pointing out, we're isolated. We we have a lot of control of our situation if we want to use it. So that's the question. Are they actually going to apply all of these plans and notions uh, for, for containing the virus? Because if they don't, and if the deep pockets of business are not available to Hawaii, then we're not going to be able to do the, the sufficient job of isolation. Uh, and uh, so this is my- Okay, all right. And, and Winston, do you shake your head up or down, left or right on that? Uh, you know what? It's, it's complex. We need a lot of brains. We need a lot of input. We need as much discussion and transparency to, to, so that the cream can rise to the top and we choose, make the best choices. And if we make our own choice, we make a better choice. And we keep doing that, repeat, until we have finished with this. Okay, well, that, I guess I, what I hear you saying is we have to do Coronaville what's next um, every week. We have to keep on doing this. And it's not a problem because I wrote my notes. I sent you guys my notes and we covered roughly 20% of what was on my notes. There's lots more to discuss. Uh, th thank you, Winston. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, see you thank next you. time. Aloha. Aloha. Yay.